It, it, it'll stand for something in your workplace. It'll stand for something in your family. It'll stand for something in every area of your life. It's easy to stand for Jesus here. It's a little bit more difficult when we leave here, doesn't it? And so we learn a lot of lessons from, from Stephen here of really making a stand. And remember, he's making a stand out of a position of fullness, not emptiness. He's not going 120 miles an hour, and Jesus is just a good thought in his life. Jesus is his life. He's full. He's making a stand from a position of fullness, like we talked about last week. I'm going to re refer to that. That's why I still have it up here, because it's a good reminder when we stand for Christ from a position that we are full, isn't it the power of the Holy Spirit that really works through us? Amen. Right? But if we're just dried up, and we say, oh, I'm going to take a stand for Jesus, and we try to do it under our own power, it never works out quite the way we envision it, does it? So, so we have to, and Stephen is from a position of fullness that he's taking the stand. So, our lives will always stand for what? Something. As a Christ follower, as a Christ follower, our life stands for three things that we can grab from Stephen's speech. The first is this, our life has to stand for Scripture. Our life has to stand for Scripture. Stephen starts his defense. This is the majority of this whole passage, right? He starts, what does he do? What does he do? He just quotes Scripture. He gives, he gives, he recounts the history, which is in the Torah. It's just scripture. There's a lot of scripture that he does quote in here. I'm not going to get into every, everything because you look through, if you look in your Bibles, you see the quotation marks. The quotation marks means he's quoting scripture. So he's quoting scripture all over the place. And so he recounts this history, this history in Genesis and Exodus. So I'm just, the Jews would know this. This is common ground for them. He goes, I'm not speaking against Moses. In fact, here's the deal. All, let's go all the way back to Abraham before Moses. And he brings up Abraham. And we're introduced to Abraham at the end of Genesis chapter 11, beginning in uh, uh, and then uh, Genesis 12, 30. So here's Abraham. And a lot of times we think of, oh, Father Abraham, right? You know, the song, I'm not going to sing it to you um, because it has a lot of moving pieces. I don't know, the church that I grew up in, you know, was like the, the Christian hokey pokey. Father Abraham had many sons. I am one of them. So are you. So let's all praise the Lord. Right hand, left hand. You're sitting there doing all this stuff, trying to say it, turn it around. It's like the Christian hokey pokey, right? But Abraham is, when we're introduced to Abraham, and it's, it's, we see the first time that God really dials in on uh, uh, an individual in Scripture. If you read Genesis, and Genesis is like the first 11 chapters is, and I'm going to say this knowing that not many people receive this. It's like a newspaper. It's just things that are, you're, you're just seeing, right? It's like these, clip, these, these news articles. But Genesis chapter 12, it dials in on Abraham. And Abraham was a pagan. He is actually from a country in the modern day Iran, Iraq. He didn't worship God. He was not a God worshiper. He worshiped pagan gods. And in the God of the Bible, the God of the universe, the creator of the universe, speaks to him. Pick up and take off. Now I'm going to show you something. Show you some things. So he follows God, the God of the Bible. And there's three things that we read in Genesis chapter 12, the first few verses, that these three things, we can, we can start putting building blocks of all of Scripture. He promised them land, the Holy Land, a seed, right? And through him, the whole world will be blessed. And God covenants with Abraham. He says, see this land that you're, that you're sojourning in? This 
give me yours. He didn't even, this passage seems as he didn't even have, he didn't even have a foot length of ownership in it. But it's going to be all yours. And he's going, you're going to have, you're going to have descendants that are going to be so numerous like the sands on the seashore and stars in the sky. But the most important thing, he goes, through you, the whole world will be blessed. What is God promising Abraham in that promise? The Messiah, Jesus. We see, and, and, and we see that God reinforces this covenant with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. We even see, we even see David uh, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 7. God covenants with David that there will always be that blessing that the whole world will be blessed. He dials in on that and goes, there will always be someone sitting on the throne. What is he talking about? He's talking about an earthly throne? No, here again, the Messiah. Nothing's the throne, Jesus. God tells, God tells David, say, listen, your descendant, your descendant is going to be the Messiah. Your descendant is going to be the Savior of the world. This is, I mean, you can see where your mind can get kind of explode here with this. So I can talk a lot about Abraham because um, I, am, I am a firm believer by understanding Genesis. In the account of Genesis, all the scripture starts to make more sense. Understanding how God works, speaks, his promises through Genesis, everything, every, a lot of things start making sense. So I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in that. So I can like camp on Abraham and talk about Abraham because he reinforces the covenant in uh, Genesis chapter 15 and in Genesis chapter 17. Uh, the, the covenant is made and it was uh, the covenant of circumcision was made. It was the sign of the covenant, which, which Stephen also talks about. And so, uh, and then, uh, then, then the religious leaders, circumcision and the law are really big, 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 big deals to them. And Stephen knows this. That's why he kind of goes after them and says, you're circumcised in your ears and your heart. And, they're, and they freak out. Why did they freak out? Because that's exactly what God said that the nation Israel would be. Right? We'll get to that in a minute. And so he, he goes on to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. Becomes the 12 tribes of Israel. A famine hits the land because they're just sojourners. They don't own anything. They're just kind of wandering around in the tent, you know. And uh, then his second youngest was his favorite. Was Jacob's favorite. Well, that kind of perturbed the other, the other, t uh, actually the, the other nine because Benjamin wasn't in on it. So then, well, let's get rid of this guy. And so they sold him, and he events, eventually becomes uh, second in charge in the land of Egypt. And so, you know, Stephen is, is, is saying all this stuff, and the religious leaders are like, we know, absolutely. We don't see any fault in him right now. He's saying exactly what we believe. Right, good. You can hear the amens in the religious council. Right, amen, yep, amen, 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 mm, amen. Good job, Stephen. And so, so in Egypt, the nation Israel is there for 400 years. Well, what did they do in 400 years? They had babies. They had lots of babies and more babies. And the babies had babies. The babies had babies. And there was this huge multiplication. Now they're, now they're a nation. Now they're a nation. <laughs> Egypt looks at them and says, man, if they rise up against us, we're toast. So what did Egypt do? Let's enslave them. Let's get them to build stuff for us. So they enslaved the Israelites. And, and they called out to God. They said, God, will you send a deliverer? God sent us from this oppression. God hears that prayer. God hears that prayer. And so he sends Moses. And it's very interesting that Stephen says in, in uh, his defense, the event that really 
that really like kicked Moses out of Egypt. And it was, it was, um, uh, he killed an Egyptian and then he took off. He had to, he, he fled. And then, you know, he's, he's in the land of Midian for 40 years. So he's 80 years old at the point that, that God speaks to him in the burning bush. Right? He's about 80 years old. He's 40 years old when he, uh, when he kills the Egyptian. He's another 40 years that has passed, and he sees the burning bush. And so he sees the burning bush. And at that, the religious leaders are saying, hey, man, God, oh, God showed up to Moses, spoke to Moses, hey, man. It started for the nation Israel at that burning bush. So he goes and he, and, and he sends Moses back to Egypt. And he gives hands that, 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 that <laughs> by his hands, you have all the, the plagues of Egypt and all that other stuff, right? But then he says something very interesting in this. He goes, the nation Israel rejected Moses. He said a couple times. At first, first before he took off, but then he goes, he went, they rejected Moses. They rejected his leadership. They rejected him being sent by God. And so, so they're like, really? So you start to see, he's starting to build tension here. And so, it's the right hook is coming. And he pretty much says that, guess what? I haven't rejected Moses, but you have. So the right hook is coming. So he's building up this tension. And he does this by in verse 53, when they said that you break the, you know, you have the law, but you break the law themselves. What is he speaking of? Well, part of the law is that you will not bear a false witness to your brother, right? But what did the religious leaders do? They brought false witnesses up against him. They broke the law. And so it was, it was, it was just really interesting, uh, you know, it, it started, the tension is starting to, to build. And he quotes the prophets, he quotes Psalms, he quotes the Torah, a lot of the stuff that, you know, we read in, in, in uh, uh, the book of Exodus. And here's the thing, he says, this is true, I believe in this. I believe the Torah to be true. I believe the Psalms and the prophets to be true. And he can make a stand because he believes with all his heart that this is true. We have the same choice in front of us. We have to believe that the Bible is true. It's not just a book full of fancy fairy tales. It is true historical accounts. These things actually happen. God is who he said he is. It is God's love letter to us if we are not able to stand on the truth of scripture. We will not be able to take a stand on anything else. I mean, that's just a reality. And we live in a day and age I'll be honest with you. Not many people are taking the stand on the truth of Scripture. I don't know pastors that don't even take a stand on the truth of Scripture. And it scratches my head. And I'm like, what do you preach on on Sunday then? Because it can't be from the Bible, because if you don't believe it in truth, why do you preach it? You can't just preach morality. You have to preach God's word that we are all sinners saved by grace. Because it's all about Jesus. If, you, if we don't take a stand in the truth of scripture, we open the door for the false teaching and falsehood to just flood in. And we live in a day and age that there are churches that are just completely buying Selling out the truth of scripture for the truth that this world is trying to push. No government can not tell, no government can't tell us what we believe. No government, no institution. We have to believe that God's word is true. 
I can talk about a lot of apologetical uh, things of, of proving the reliability of Scripture, but then that will take up most of our time, and I'm not going to. I mean, it's all there. The evidence is, is very easily readily available to, to understand the reliability of Scripture. The Bible's true. We have to, we have to stand on the Word of God in our lives. That's the first thing that we see Stephen do. That's pretty much the majority of his message. He goes, oh, the false witnesses say, I don't believe in Moses, that I don't believe in the temple, that I don't believe in the law. Well, let me tell you what I really believe. And all he does is quote scripture. And he's able to stand. Remember, remember here, he's able to take the stand from a position of fullness. Okay? And so, I hate to, you know, we have to take a stand on, on, on scripture. Uh, we also have to take a stand for worship. We have to take a stand for worship. Because what Stephen starts to talk about. It's very interesting. He starts to talk about the temple. He starts to talk about that when they're only about a week or so out of Egypt, week, two weeks, or shortly after they're out of Egypt, and they're, they're in the camp, and Moses is up talking to God on the, on the mountain, and they have a golden calf issue, uh, and then he talks about the, the temple, or the, the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, and how that plays out in history. So here's the deal. He gives the historical account of the temple. Now by the time Stephen is saying this, and even Jesus, and Jesus talked about the temple all the time, uh, it's, it's brick and mortar. It's brick and mortar. In fact, this is like the second or third temple, I think, by the time Jesus, because it was destroyed in the Babylonian captivity, and then um, uh, then it was rebuilt. And so uh, it was it was uh, it was rebuilt by uh, we read on uh, Nehemiah and Zerubbabel, but I think it was destroyed again in in, in this the third temple. I you know I know third somebody said third. Um, so the whole thing is it's brick and mortar by this time. And Jesus even said, even the disciples saying, hey, look how great this place is. And Jesus says, guess what? This is all going to be gone. And that's in Matthew 24. And then he gets into the whole, uh, he gets into the whole, here's the events of the end of a, the end of the age, right? And Jesus also said, destroy this temple in three days and I'll rebuild it. What was he talking about? He's talking about his body, right? And so Stephen says, listen, Moses was given the tent of meeting at Mount Sinai. And the tent of meeting is the centerpiece, the, 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 the tabernacle and the tent of meeting is a centerpiece in Old Testament history. And the nation Israel, as well as end of age uh, prophecies. It is centerpiece. Because, why do I say that? Because in Matthew, uh, when Jesus talks about the end of the age, uh, he says, uh, before the end comes, you'll see the abomination that causes desolation. Now, he's, he's quoting uh, uh, Daniel. We saw, we saw the abomination uh, that caused desolation uh, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But then uh, he's, he's saying, listen, in order for the abomination that caused the, the, the desolation, which means that the temple will be defiled, that means there has to be a temple in order for Jesus to come back. Even, even as we look towards the coming of Jesus, think about the temple. And there are things, this is a little sidebar, there are things happening in the nation Israel that's moving towards this. This year, this year, I read an article two weeks ago. This year, for the first time in 2,000 years, they're opening the Pool of Shalom. You know, the, where the angel stirred and the paralytic came in and Jesus came and healed the paralytic? First time in 2,000 years that's going to be open. It's been completely restored. Little things like that are big news. Big, big news. 
So anyway, the tabernacle and the tent of meeting, tent of meeting, tabernacle, and the temple are actual replicas of heaven itself. That's why Moses, that's why God gave Moses the dimensions specifically. I mean, it is to the detail. You read through the book of uh, Exodus and Leviticus, it goes to the detail. Why is it? Because it is a complete representation, a replica of God's throne room in heaven. And it was a big, big deal. God dwelt in the nation of Israel by the pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night, and he rested on the holy of holies. Now, there are times when God's presence wasn't with the nation of Israel, right? And then there's times that he is. So it's interesting because he talks about David. David wanted to build a temple. David is a man after God's own heart, wanted to build a temple. And what did, and, and God, what did God tell David? No, it's not for you to do it. Why? Because he's a man of blood, a man of war. And so he goes, no, I'm going to have your son do it. So Solomon builds the temple. And we read that God's presence showed up in that temple. When Solomon built it, his glory rested on the temple. And it's the first brick and mortar temple that we that we see in scripture. And so, um, but then, you know, before that, I totally sidetracked, uh, but before that, he says, listen, ever since the Exodus, that we're at the mountain, the nation of Israel always found something else to worship. Always found something else to worship. Where did they worship at the mountain? The golden calf. See, the interesting thing about that whole account was this. They make the golden calf, and they're dancing, and they're worshiping it, and all this other stuff. And God speaks to Moses, you better get down there because they're out of control. Right? So Moses comes down, confronts Aaron, saying, what are you doing? Aaron has the, the biggest excuse in the Bible is what Aaron says next. Oh, you know how Moses, I don't know, you know, all the people, we all threw gold in the fire and out jumped this cow. <laughs> Got me. I don't know. They knew what they were doing. They worshiped a false image. And, and, and Stephen says, listen, this is a part of all of the, the, the history of Israel, constantly going after other gods. In fact, he quotes Amos chapter 5 and the prophet saying, listen, they even said this you are. You, 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 you worship Molech and, and this by this, this guy and stuff. And we see this in the nation of Israel's history. They always found something else to worship except for God of the Bible. It goes right, it goes back to it goes back to the Exodus, Saul, King Saul. He did not worship God with the whole heart, right? You know, and so they always find something else to worship. <clears throat> Stephen is talking to a bunch of people that, that the religious establishment, they also worship. They worship the tradition, the power, their power, their greed. And he goes, you're just in the long list of all the false gods that led up to the Babylonian captivity. What is the Babylonian captivity? That's when the nation of Israel was not following God for, for a very long time. And God says, okay, time to discipline you. You're going in captivity. And they went to Babylon. And that's when we, we are introduced to Daniel and uh, a couple other. Uh, Jeremiah talks about it, right? So that was a form of discipline because they weren't worshiping God. We do the same thing. We, we need to take a stand for worship. And, and he says, listen, who do we worship? Because in verse 48, he says, guess what? God's not confined to anything that we create for worship. And he quotes Isaiah chapter 66. And we see this throughout the Psalms. He says, let me ask you, does God... Is God only here with us on Sunday mornings as we worship him? No. He's everywhere we go. Our whole life has 
has to be worship. It's not worship isn't something that we go to. Worship is something that we are. We're all created as outflows. Every single one of us will always find something to worship. John Calvin says the, the heart is an idol factory. We'll always create different idols to worship. Always. We constantly have to keep ourselves in check that we are worshiping the God of idol. Let me ask you this. What is worship? What's that thing that you're willing to die for? That you'll give your life to? What's that thing that you're willing to, to physically die for? That is what you worship. That is what you worship. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a possession or the, the pursuit of a possession. Maybe it's your career. You're just willing to die to advance your career. Maybe it's maybe intentionally or unintentionally that addiction. Sometimes it's intentionally that we're willing to die for our addiction, but it's also unintentionally that we're just hooked and we're just continuing to worship that addiction and addiction and addiction because that addiction has us by its claws. What are you willing to die for? That is what we worship. That is a question we can ask ourselves every single day of this week. What am I willing to die for today? Once you can name that, and if it's not Jesus, then we, then, then you can say, okay, God, you need to do some work in my heart and in my life. <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. But where is that thing where you're willing to die for? We see Matthew chapter 6 is a worship challenge. Like, seek first the kingdom of God. Matthew 10 and Matthew 16. Jesus says, losing your life for Jesus, you will find it. Now, is that a, like a complete, you're physically dying? It can be applied that way. It can be applied a couple different ways, but still, are you willing to lose your life for Jesus? Your very self for Jesus. We are to take up our cross daily. That means we are to die to ourselves and to be alive to Jesus every day. The cross is an execution, form of Roman execution. Crucify ourselves all throughout Scripture. You see, taking a stand for what we worship every day is a very hard thing to do. It's a very hard thing to do. Taking a stand for corporate worship, weekly gatherings, because guess what? There's people that think that we shouldn't be gathered for worship. Guess what? There's places in this world that this is even illegal. Taking a stand for this is easy. Taking a stand for yourself on a day-by-day -day basis. Now, that's hard. That's hard. Goes back to the question, what are you willing to die for? What are you willing to die for? Because once you then you can stand for worship. Worship the God of the Bible. And then we also take a stand, we take a stand for Jesus. Of course we take a stand for Jesus, right? Good Sunday school answer. Take a stand for Jesus. But <laughs> so Stephen goes about it really interesting. Here's the right hook. Big time right hook. He comes up to a point in verse 51. He goes, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears. Why do you reject the Holy Spirit? Now, here's the application, right? Where is he getting at? Because you're just like the nation Israel. You're just like the nation. Why do I say that? Because you stiff-necked people. He's actually quoting Exodus.